Thank you very much, choir and Cheryl. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Uh, appreciate the beautiful piano work there, even afterwards. And uh, did you hear it too on the uh, wonderful grace of Jesus? Uh, I love <laughs> piano music, and uh, I appreciate your piano music, and I do with some jealousy. I got to confess that today, and there's a reason why I do, and that is growing up in the Noel household, three of us kids, when you reach the third grade, it meant something mandatory piano lessons all three of us when it came to third grade we had to take piano lessons i still remember it at first i kind of liked it when it was one finger at a time and mary had a you know that kind of thing but when you start into getting to play two fingers at the same time and three fingers and four and five fingers all at the same time with this guy who can't walk and chew gum at the same time that was a challenge so I always admire somebody who can play the piano and always blessed by piano music. And uh, have you ever had that happen before? You have an admiration for somebody's ability because you've tried and just really wasn't successful at that talent. I got to thinking about that this week because I got to thinking as I was preparing today's message about another activity I enjoy but I'm not very good at. And that's ping pong. I have always loved ping pong, never really good at it, but, but again, some of my earliest memories are, are going down to the rec center, the YMCA when I was a kid, chucking out that 10 cents on Saturday morning or one of the school day afternoons, and, and you could rent two paddles and all the ping pong balls you, you didn't knock into the roof or, or out the window, and we would play ping pong. It was fun to do that in those days, and even in high school and college, and even when I got to seminary. We had an activity room, and there I would play ping pong. But you know what about those days? I made a lot of friendships with students from Asia. Now, can you see where this is going already? You know, people in Asia, they are born with a ping pong paddle in their hand. You, you look at the Olympic history, constantly the, the gold medalist in table tennis, as they call it, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, you know? And so uh, I would play ping pong with my Asian friends in seminary. And they would smile when they saw me on the other side of the table. <laughs> but you know what they used to do in the goodness of their heart? Before we would start a match up to 21 points, they'd spot me 10 points in advance. <laughs> and then they'd proceed to beat me 21 to 10. Right? <laughs> No, 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 typically it was like 21, 13, or 14. They might miss a shot or two, and that would get me a point. But, but up front, they would give me that grace of, of, of 10 points. But you know, after getting beat all of those times, I, I began to think about something, and that is that if I was going to be victorious, not only did I need that grace from them up front, I needed it throughout the competition. I needed it to the very end. You ever had anybody to offer you grace like that? How many of you remember in school, you have this assignment, you have a due date, it's a lot of hard work, and like a day before everything is due, the teacher says, I'm going to extend this a few more days, I'm going to give you a grace period. How many of you remember that? How many of you have ever had a, a, a bill that is due and, and there's that due date and you're kind of stretched from funds. You talk to the person you owe the money to and, and they give you a little bit of an extension. They give you some grace. Think about the grace of, of second chances. How many of you have been given second chances in the classroom, in the workplace, in a relationship? All of those are examples of grace. And when we get grace in human relationships like that, you know what it does? It gives us a good picture of who God is. Because if you think about all the different words that describe God, we think about words like love, we think about words like holy, but another word that has to come to mind is the word grace. The word grace. Today we're going to look at Scripture, we're going to look at a leader of the church, a guy by the name of Peter. He was one of the original uh, 12 disciples, and he was somebody who was very fiery, and he was somebody who really loved to speak his mind and take charge. Now, like us, many times he would uh, kind of put that mouth in motion before the brain was fully in gear. 
take that big foot and stick it right in his mouth. You've never done that, have you? Peter had that habit. And, and in the worst moment of his life, he publicly denied ever knowing Jesus. But then you know what? Jesus died on the cross, rose again, met with Peter, and forgave him, restored him. Several days later, filled him with the Holy Spirit and gave him a, a courage that he never had before. And with that, he began to share the message of Jesus with all of the world. One of the things the Lord laid upon his heart to do was to write letters to the churches. And two of those letters are in our New Testament. And you know, in the second letter that he was inspired to write, it starts out this way. He, he addresses the situation in the world. He speaks some words of prophecy. He warns the believers about false teachers. And then at the very end of the letter, the very final verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says this. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I really want to focus upon that opening part there as it says, but grow in the grace. Grow in the grace. What exactly does that mean, to grow in the unconditional love of God? Because if you think about it, there's all kind of, of definitions for the word grace, right? The theologians would say to us that grace means God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. One person has said simply, grace means that, that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. One creative person came up with this. said, if you don't want to know what grace is, take the word grace, the five letters G-R-A-C-E, and realize something. They stand for God's riches at Christ's expense. That's creative, isn't it? At the expense of Jesus Christ, his life, his death at the cross, his rising again from the dead, from all of that, we have these heavenly riches that God wants to pour out upon every one of us. And that's what Paul dri or Peter drives home in this final verse of 2 Peter chapter 3, the 18th verse. But what does it mean to, to grow in that kind of grace? To answer that, I want to look at a collection of verses of Scripture today. Every one of them contains the word grace and every one of them is in one of the letters, not of Peter, but of Paul. And that's appropriate because sometimes Paul is called the, the apostle of grace. So let's see what the Lord laid on his heart to write as well. First passage I want to look at is in 2 Timothy. It's in the first chapter, verses 8 and 9. And this is what it says. It says, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner." Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Do you know what that tells every one of us today? It tells us that God's grace has always been at work. God's grace has always been at work. Think about all of creation. Think about how God made the world. Think about every beautiful mountain landscape. Think about every wonderful walk along the ocean shore. Think about all the springtime flowers. Think about all the many colors we see in the fall. God created every bit of this. It's an expression of his grace, his unmerited love and favor and blessing for every single one of us. And as it says, that grace has always been at work, even when we don't realize it. You know, as Methodists, we trace our Christian heritage back uh, to Jesus, but through a man by the name of John Wesley, a man who lived in England in the 1700s. And he loved to talk about how God's grace works in hearts and works in people even before they realize it, even before they come to faith in Christ. He had a name for it. He called it prevenient grace. It means the grace that goes before. As Methodists, we, we believe in and we practice infant baptism. 
Now, as we had a baptism two weeks ago, that infant, that child, was that child at a point of making a decision to believe in Jesus? No. Mm -mm. But what we were doing was recognizing God's grace at work in that child. You see, it was a work of God's grace that two parents were standing there making a commitment to raise this child in a Christian way. And it is also an expression of grace when the whole church says, we're going to help to raise this child in a Christian way. That's one example of, of God's grace being at work even before you realize it. Can you look back on your own life and, and realize that? I think about those early years of my life when I, I believed in God but kept God at a distance and said all this Jesus talk is good and nice, but I, I really don't need it. But you know, God patiently kept bringing people into my life to tell me about Jesus and to demonstrate what the love of Jesus is all about. And as I look back on Sunday school teachers and friends and people who shared that message, they were expressions of God's grace in my life even before I knew Jesus. And I thank God for every one of them. It's a reminder to us that God's grace has always been at work. I want to look at another passage of Scripture. This one is Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9. And this should kind of uh, connect with you. I hope it brings to mind something. I, I preached from it two weeks ago. So if you don't remember it, I might need to preach to you again from that passage. But uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. As I told you two weeks ago, it's one of those passages of Scripture that just sums up the message of Jesus so briefly, so succinctly. But you know what those two verses tell us today? They remind us that salvation is purely by God's grace. We talked about that two weeks ago, salvation, God's gift of, of forgiveness and newness of life, of a new beginning. A life that brings us joy and peace and hope. A, a life that promises us everlasting life. That is God's salvation. And it is a gift to every one of us. It is purely by God's grace. Emily and I were talking just the other day about a Bible story from the Old Testament. She remember reading it from her children's Bible. The story of the Tower of Babel. How many of you remember that story? All those people building that tower as tall as they could. But, but in the end, it came to nothing. They were trying to work their way up to God and build their way up to God. How often do we try to play the same game? Thinking that if we go to church enough, and go to Sunday school enough, and get those 25 points for singing in the choir, we'll just gradually work our way up there. But we can't. It's only by grace. It's only in realizing that this salvation is a gift that we are to receive freely through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is purely by God's grace. Let's take a look at a, another passage of Scripture that speaks of this grace. This time it's in Titus, the second chapter. We want to look at verses 11 and 12. And there Paul writes to this servant of God and says... For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You know what that reminds us? That reminds us that God's grace enables us to live a godly life. God's grace enables us to live a godly life. There's so many misconceptions in the Christian life, and one of those is these, and that is that when we come to faith in Jesus, that is the goal, that is the conclusion, that is the end. And in fact, it's actually the beginning. The beginning of a brand new life. The beginning of a life as a whole new person. Uh, the beginning of life with no longer self at the center of everything, but Jesus at the center of everything. And as we begin that new life, and as we grow in grace, as the Scripture reminds us today, our goal is that we would grow 
and become closer to Jesus and that we would grow and we would become more and more like Jesus. That's the goal. And God gives us the power by his grace to do that. We need his grace, his blessings, again, his intervention, his everlasting love for that to happen. One of the ways I've heard Christian growth sometimes described or pictured is like this. It's, it's kind of like we're in a house and, and God has this huge watering can and, and that can contains all of his grace that's necessary for our growth as Christians. But for us to have access to that grace that helps us to grow, we've got to open up some of those windows. One of those windows is called prayer. And if we open up that window by praying, we receive more and more of God's grace. Another window would be called Bible study. As we open up the Bible and, and begin to read and study the Bible, we're opening up another window to God's grace and blessing. Uh, another window would be called worship. That every time we join with sisters and brothers to worship, we're opening up another window to grace and allowing God's grace to work. Another window would be called service following in the footsteps of Jesus, loving and serving other people and experiencing his grace all along the way. Another window would be called generosity. Remembering how giving and generous God is and allowing that generosity to be lived out in every part of our lives. Again, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he had a word for these Christian practices. He called them means of grace. Practices, exercises, if you will, not to build our way up to heaven or construct our own tower of Babel, but a means of experiencing more and more of God's grace so that we can grow in that grace and we can live that godly life. God's grace enables us to live a, a godly life. Another passage of Scripture I want to point out to you is Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 6. And here Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. He says this, he says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. But look back on the first half of that verse. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. You see, when you choose to believe in Jesus Christ and Jesus comes to live in you in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit gifts us in different ways. God gives us supernatural talents and abilities to use for God. All of us are called to be servants, but, but God calls us to serve in different tasks and different roles and using different gifts. We don't choose those. God chooses them, and he freely gives them and develops them and uses them to make a difference in the world. He does that by his wonderful grace. Then another passage of Scripture is 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the 7th verse. Paul's writing to the Christians in Corinth, and he says these words. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. See that you excel in the grace of giving. You know what Paul is saying in those words? He's saying God's grace is to be shared. God's grace is to be shared. This wonderful grace that he pours into our lives and does all of these different things. It's not for us to be hoarded to ourselves. It's in turn to be shared. In the immediate context of this scripture, what, what Paul is talking about, he is, he is encouraging the Corinthians, thanking them for how generous and how giving they have been in supporting his ministry. And, and he's saying, I want you to continue on in that grace of giving. He's saying to them, God has been so generous to you and, and, and by his grace, he's poured out generosity and providing for everything in your life. Now allow that generosity to flow out of you to other people. But you know that on a, a much broader sense, what he's describing there is living a life of grace. 
taking a look at all that God has done in your life by his grace and allowing him to live it out in every part of your life. Let me ask you today, have you experienced God's unconditional love and, and everlasting salvation? Have you done that? Well, if you have experienced his everlasting love, the invitation then is to allow that love to flow through you and out of you to everyone. Have you today experienced God's loving mercy and forgiveness? Have you experienced that? Well, then if you have experienced that kind of grace, then allow that mercy and forgiveness to flow out of you and to absolutely everyone. Paul, in one of his letters, simply put it this way. He said, be imitators of God. Allow all that God has done in your heart and your life, by his grace, to flow out of you and to absolutely everyone. God's grace is to be shared. That's a lot of verses about grace, isn't it? A lot for you to think about, a lot for you to chew on, a lot to digest. But all of them remind us of a life of grace. These Sundays following Easter, we're looking how we are people of the resurrection. And we're looking each week at what that means. Two Sundays ago, how, how we are a people of salvation. And, and last Sunday, we looked at it even more, didn't we? How we are a people of purpose. And today it's that we are a people of grace. And that we want to allow that grace of God that has done so much in changing and transforming our lives that we would live it out in every way. And that every day we would grow in that grace. Some 300 years ago in the country of England there lived a man named John. No, I'm not talking about John Wesley, even though he lived in England 300 years ago. A different man named John. A man who was, like John Wesley, raised in a Christian home. But as he grew up and began to go to work, he kind of let go of that faith and pushed it to the side. He threw himself into his work and worked real hard in the shipping industry. He got promotion after promotion. Until finally, by his late 20s, he was already the captain of his own ship. But oh, it was a horrible ship. You see, it was a slave ship. He would set sail out of England and head down to the west coast of Africa and pick up slaves, taking people in bondage and taking them over to the Caribbean and then completing that evil triangle back to England again. Trip after trip after trip and making all sorts of money and wealth in the process. But seeing the way he was putting people in human bondage and then selling them off in other places and ripping apart families. It weighed so heavy on his conscience. And about that time, someone in his life began to talk about Jesus. And as... This man, John, heard more and more about that. It drew him back to that faith they'd been brought up with. Until finally one day he surrendered his life to Jesus. And in time he let go of working in the shipping industry. And he began to testify and, and he began to preach and he began to share wherever he could. But not only did he do that, he began to write poems about this newfound faith. And some of those poems were even put to music. And one of them contains these very words. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. That man's name was John Newton. And that most beloved uh, Christian hymn in the English language, Amazing Grace. You see, for John Newton, that grace of God had definitely changed his life. And so he was wanting to live out that grace. And every single day, he was wanting to grow in that grace. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. For your unconditional love. Thank you for all your blessings and all the things you freely give. Thank you that you know everything there is to know about us. And yet you still love us. Lord Jesus, fill us with your grace today. And do whatever you wish in each one of our lives. Lord, you know each and every need here today. And by your grace, reach down and meet that. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Do I even need to tell you what song we're going to sing? <laughs> Amazing Grace. As we sing, the altar's open. If you want to come and pray and bring to the Lord any need, any desire for his grace to move and work in your life in any special way, I just invite you to come. Let's all stand. Let's sing together Amazing Grace. Amen.